Hello everyone, this is Professor Stanley, Louisiana State University, Alexandria, Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences. This is Poly 2051, and we're in the fall of 2017. And today uh, I would like to go over a discussion of Chapter 12 with everyone, since we talked about Chapter 11 last week and I did mention to everyone that I'm going to be a little bit more involved with chapters uh, that deal with the Congress, Presidency, and the Judiciary. So just be aware of that and be knowledgeable about the information contained in those chapters as you will probably more than likely have a brief quiz on the information that we go over together. So needless to say the information is important and I stressed that last week so I won't go into that a lot this week but that's something you just need to keep in mind as we go forward. So chapter 12 is about the presidency, specifically the American presidency or the US president. There is a lot to discuss in this chapter. However, be mindful that my goal is to provide you with enough information for you to draw your own conclusions. So to give you a very basic understanding of the subject matter that we go over in the book. And hopefully you've been able to do that this far and you've been able to learn and take away some knowledge from the this fundamentals course. And you have to remember even though we have Poly 1001, the Fundamentals of Government class, the American Government class 2051 is very much also a Fundamentals class. For those of you that want to learn more about political science and the way things work here in the United States with regard to governance, things of that nature, we do offer upper level advanced courses that uh, are electives. In other words, they're not required. Those courses you may take just to enhance your knowledge or you may decide you want a general concentration, uh, excuse me, general studies with a concentration in political science, which there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually a good path for those of you who are interested in the subject. Nevertheless, we are going to talk about Chapter 12 today, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm actually broadcasting uh, to you all from a local library here. So if you look around, you can see the other rooms in the library. So there are students here and, and they are learning and I'm trying to keep uh, my voice down a little bit. I don't want to get too excited, but you all know that I do get excited about this subject and it is always a pleasure for me to bring it to you guys and you girls and everyone that uh, wants to learn about it. So let's get started on chapter 12 uh, regarding the American presidency and we did talk about uh, the cover of your book, if you take a notice up there on your screen, you can see, as I was saying last week, how it resembles a smartphone. So I find that interesting. Our learning outcomes very briefly identify people who seriously think about running for president or campaigning for presidency. You have to remember that this is a large undertaking, not many individuals are capable of doing that and 
some of the major roles those individuals have. Um, the book tells you, you know, verbatim what they are. Uh, head of state, chief executive, super politician, commander in chief, those types of things. And we'll talk about those a little bit as we go through the chapter. But as I said earlier, I want to be as concise as I can with you about the information because, again, it is a lot of information to digest. And you do have to do a lot of the readings on your own to understand that information. Special powers to the president is also discussed here in this chapter. And a recurring theme that I want you to keep in mind as we go along is that the powers granted to the president change over time. And if you notice throughout history, they generally change with needs of society. Um, or the attitudes and beliefs of the people at that time. The executive branch, as with the other two branches, or are very highly organized. So that's another thing we'll talk about is the organizational structure of those brand of the executive branch, which, uh, to make a long story short, the executive branch is responsible for carrying out the functions of the legislation that Congress passes into law. So keep that in mind. And the judiciary is responsible for making sure those laws remain objective. However, as we will learn later, the Supreme Court and the judiciary has become increasingly politicized especially over the last uh, one or two decades or so. And we'll talk about some of the reasons behind that. And uh, also we'll discuss the vice presidency and what happens in the event that something does happen to the president or um, in the event that he is, uh, an attempt on his life is made. Um, we'll discuss the scenarios and, and what happens with that as well. So who runs for president? A uh, natural born citizen, number one. That is the most obvious thing that is discussed in the Constitution. Presidential characteristics. Typically these individuals are groomed for this office. Most of them are highly educated. They come from elite colleges across the country. Yale, Harvard, Stanford, uh, those types of colleges. And those individuals, again, have this goal in mind throughout their political career. So someone doesn't just get up one day and decide that they're going to run for president. It is a very well thought out decision and the individual has made a case to do so. The process of becoming president is very complicated. <laughs> to say it lightly, it starts with the presidential primaries and those primaries are held within each state and delegates are sent to those primaries to um, in theory, sort of represent the citizens of that state. So each state sends delegates, and what you see, uh, the delegates that are elected eventually go to the national committee. So you have the Republican National Committee, the Democratic National Committee, those delegates ultimately get together and decide who ultimately will take on the party identification, one of those terms you learned earlier in the book, and ultimately represent that party in running for the office of president of the United States of America. So it is a lot of interesting background to 
how presidents are actually nominated within their own party. And so the 12th Amendment basically says that the president and vice president have to be elected separately. Um, that was passed in 1804. So uh, the amendment ratified the Constitution effectively for that purpose. Here we have JFK and Ronald Reagan. I believe that I mentioned the fact that JFK did have some health problems and that it would be harder to actually run for office and win today if you had health problems because they are a little bit more difficult to um, disguise in today's modern times. So information is very public. You have the paparazzi, you have the watchdog groups, you have the interest groups that are all keeping tabs. Uh, so that would not have been in John Kennedy's favor. Would it be compared to today's times? Uh, Ronald Reagan was the oldest president to be elected into office. And I would say that if he were to run today, history would be even more so on his side, simply because of the large amount of people that are now age 65 plus in this country. And I mentioned to you all that it is better to have history on your side. Running for president is not easy. When you have an electorate that is behind you and supports you, albeit maybe not vocally, as we learned in the past election, there were apparently a lot of Trump supporters that were not making headlines in the media. So tapping into the voting base and the voting block is something that is very important. And it also depends on the determinants of the population at the time an individual is running for office, such as the example that I just gave you with Ronald Reagan. Roles of the president, very briefly, head of state, and a lot of these things are symbolic. So some of these roles are symbolic or they contain a lot of symbolism, which you may or may not have picked up in English class as something that shows uh, the importance of something else, okay? Or something that demonstrates important symbolic. Uh, the flag, an American bald eagle, those types of things. So the head of state is typically um, what the president is viewed as, ultimately the leader of the United States. So it is very much a symbolic role. The chief executive, just to discuss some of the things, uh, the day-to-day -day business of being president, powers of appointment and removal, okay? Presidents appoint and uh, ultimately dismiss a lot of individuals that are in public office. And the majority of positions in public offices today around the country are not elected, okay? So they are appointed to positions. And for whatever reason, they may be dismissed from those positions. Uh, granting of reprieves and pardons, this is something that has become a little I should say less accepted uh, as modern times have demonstrated. Um, typically, when you pardon an individual, that means that they have committed some sort of crime. And in the eyes of the general public, that is not a very good thing to do. 
especially um, for Republican candidates who generally run on the idea of the power of law or the rule of law in society. Harry Truman is a interesting character that you'll learn about more as you pro hopefully have read in the book. He's pictured here with General Eisenhower, who eventually became president later on. And the debate still rages today with regard to um, should all presidents have some sort of military experience. And notice I said it is a debate that still goes on today. There are people that advocate for that, and there are people that do not think it is a good idea. So that's a position that you will have to come up with on your own. Uh, however, I will say that characteristics of leadership and things that you do gain in the military uh, cannot be taught anywhere in civil society, typically, because you are not trained to be under that kind of duress or emergency danger situations. So I will say that the military leaders do receive that type of training, so it is beneficial to them. And the previous presidents have shown that that training is very valuable in the office. Um, here you see a picture of President Barack Obama and then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton campaigning in Charlotte, North Carolina. And North Carolina is one of those states that's a very prized possession to win in uh, you know, a general election. So a lot of time is spent campaigning there by people that are running for president. As you saw in the last election, a lot of time was spent there. And Barack Obama, President Obama, did spend a lot of time uh, campaigning with Hillary Clinton. And also other candidates that were running for other positions, such as federal judgeships. My position on presidents who are actively involved in other, sitting presidents who are actively involved in other campaigns is that they should be focusing on the job that is at hand in their own office. Um, rather than spending all this time outside of office campaigning for other potential candidates. Now, that is certainly uh, the nature of the beast as it has been, even with presidents prior to Barack Obama. So, Commander-in-Chief, I'm going to try to move this screen around so you all can see a little bit better. Commander-in-Chief is what the president does with regard to military power. So in certain times of war or in warfare, presidents are granted exceptional powers that may be viewed as outside of the normal by Congress or the general public or whatever. The president has the power to dispatch National Guard troops to states that are in need of relief, emergency disaster situations, those types of things. And you probably have seen that more recently over the last decade or so, as we have seen with the hurricanes and the fires, for example, in California, usually in times of uh, natural disasters or in the event there is a major riot. We have also seen quite a bit of an increase 
uh, of riots over the past two or three years, more so especially over the past year. And that's uh, the reasoning for that is a number of reasons. I won't get into that. War powers resolution, that was developed from the Gulf of Tonkin resolution in 1973 under uh, President Nixon. So what had happened was President Nixon had been meddling in some affairs, I believe, with uh, Cambodia at the time. Or he had actually, he dropped some bombs in Cambodia and he wasn't supposed to. So what happened was Congress had to go back and ultimately write a new resolution to define what powers are available to the president and when those powers are available and uh, why they are available to the president. So do some reading on the War Powers Act in the book. You will probably see that again. Chief Diplomat. So the president is ultimately responsible for being diplomatic to other countries when we have other resolutions or other treaties with other countries. The president is the leader in doing that. Um, you know, there are ambassadors and there are, you know, there is the secretary of state and things like that. Ultimately, you know, and it also does go back to the sort of symbolism or the idea of the, the whole mystique of being president is that they are the chief leader of the tribe, so to speak. So it is symbolic for them to come out and to sort of either make peace or um, issue warnings to other countries when it comes to international affairs or dealing with other countries. And you have some examples here to look at on the, the PowerPoint, advice and consent, diplomatic recognition, things we've already talked about, proposal and ratification of treaties. So again, a lot of the work that goes on behind the scenes with treaties and proposals, those things are done by um, staffing assistance or aides most of the time. Okay, just like with Congress, you have bills and things that um, are done in committee. A lot of those things are done by people that are in support of the particular individual or the congressperson. And to parlay that, the same thing happens in the executive branch with the president, he has a large amount of staffers that ultimately help him develop these proposals and things on paper before he actually presents, he or she actually presents them to uh, whether it be the Congress or whether it be the individuals in other countries or even the American public. So before anything is actually said or presented, it has already been through the hands of numerous scholars, uh, legal scholars, uh, you know, political affairs, political scientists, uh, experts, people that are highly versed in the subject matter. And executive agreements, um, those are just another form of things that happens with the president as chief diplomat. President George H.W. Bush, we call him Bush One, uh, for those of you that like to sort of make a few jokes every now and then like I do. So you have Bush One, which is the father of Bush Two, which is George W. Bush. Um, they are well known for their relationship with Saudi Arabia. 
the president has was seen numerous times in meetings with Saudi Arabia and there are a number of reasons for that if you take a look if you ever go to DC uh, get a chance to go by the uh, embassy Saudi Arabian embassy and notice that it is one of the most highly guarded embassies um, in Washington DC and it's for a number of different reasons but I think that uh, you can all draw your own conclusions about that we already discussed the president as the chief legislator of the country so that is a role that you all are probably already familiar with as from the readings and also from our discussions in the class creating the congressional agenda now depending on the type of person the individual that a president is what kind of person they are and how strong they want to press Congress will ultimately decide how far they go when they are trying to sort of manipulate or not really manipulate guide a, a certain agenda and a good example of that would be the uh, Affordable Care Act of 2010 so some presidents take more of a lead on legislation than others uh, State of the Union message that is a message that is delivered before Congress and the American people and the whole point behind the State of the Union message is to give everyone sort of an update on what's going on in the country and in the White House and to sort of you know if you remember the having pep rallies in high school everyone would get together before the big game and sort of get really cheery about the team well that's the same sort of idea that's happening here the president gets in front of the people and rallies the Congress uh, well more so his own party in Congress and tries to get the American people excited about what is going on in the country so that is his job to do that as well and remember this is another one of those things that is very much so uh, symbolic with regard to the president as, as someone who is a figurehead or a talking head uh, was what the pundits would say a, a talking head in front of the American people so when they think about politics one of the first persons that comes to mind is the president and that's ultimately ultimately why he gets or she gets a lot of the blame for what is happening uh, things that are going wrong in the country at the time so that's just something to consider there getting legislation passed remember the president can advocate more or less depending on the goal of the bill or the goal of the legislation and again that is largely contingent on the time at hand in society or uh, the urgency of the need of the bill or whatever particular legislation that is being advocated for now conversely the president also has the ability to say no to legislation so on the polar opposite side of this thing you can see that the president has the power to say no and there are a number of reasons why the president may say no to a bill uh, very seldom is it a case where the president just says no 
because he doesn't like the bill. Now, that it has happened before, don't get me wrong, but if a bill makes it to the president's desk, the chances are it is a very important bill and that it is a timely bill that needs to be there. So there are a couple of different ways that the bill can be vetoed, and in the book they discuss line item veto and also the pocket veto. The pocket veto is a little less overt in tactics because what the president does is just leave it on his desk and does not do anything about it. That's why it's called a pocket veto. It's sort of just forgotten about. Like you put something in your pocket and you forget about it. Line item vetoes are a little bit more specific. There may be some items in the budget, for example, that the president does not like or in the proposed legislation. So uh, he will do what is known as strike the items. So items that are struck from the bill are sent back. The entire bill is sent back to the Congress for revision. And ultimately, Congress does have the power to override presidential vetoes. However, that does require uh, what you've learned this semester in your book as uh, what is a super majority. So we talked about the president as the uh, head of state as a super politician, as a symbolic representative of the uh, politics or the political scene of the country. And here you have a picture of George W. Bush that is giving his State of the Union address in front of a joint, what's known as a joint session of Congress, which means the House of Representatives and the Senate all gather together on Capitol Hill. Now, if you all have ever been to Capitol Hill and you've been to uh, where the House of Representatives actually meets and where the Senate meets, that building that you see pictured on TV where the address is given is actually very small. <laughs> it looks like it's a very large building, sort of like a massive building. With, where all these different people are running around. There are a lot of people there, but there is not a lot of space in those rooms. So there are a lot of camera effects that do give it the effect that it is this big, large, massive hall. And don't get me wrong, it is, it is a large building, but maybe it's just me i'm a bigger person i like to have a lot of room so there are also a lot of camera effects and dramatic effects that you have to take into account uh the president as party chief and super politician again we go back to the idea of being symbolic as what a president is expected to do to use uh, symbolism and his roles as the party chief. So he is the leader of the party. And you'll see throughout history, there have been times where parties have been in more accord with the president. And then there are times when the parties are sort of uh, drifting from each other, with the parties drifting from the president or likewise, which is a lot of what you see today in the the modern day GOP, which is the grand old party, describes the uh, re current Republican Party in power. A number of reasons behind that, uh, mainly because of the fact that the president, President Trump ran on the idea of uh, the American first America First agenda, which sets uh, the American people, according to the platform, it sets the American people in front of all the other 
legislative agendas that the government has. So chief of party, we talked about that. The patronage system, I did not talk a lot about. Basically, um, anyone that serves in the civil service capacity, more so in the old days of Washington uh, and Jefferson Jackson, Mass, all those people, patronage uh, system was used more and more because it was a who you know and who you voted for type of thing. And you'll notice it is still used a lot more, but it's more utilized in a local fashion, such as a uh, sheriff's office race or things like that. Presidential constituencies, these are individuals and groups that support the president and he is responsible for getting resources and aid or whatever it is, favorable legislation to these groups, individuals, and uh, organizations that get him elected. So I am going to pick up this pace of this presentation here a little bit because I like to keep things under an hour. Public approval. Basically, we discussed this a little bit, even more so in the uh, week's discussions today, or excuse me, this week in the class. It's hard to maintain a high level of approval simply because most human beings act on emotion. So to lo think logically, the majority of the time is something that is you can't really expect. It's not a realistic expectation. Uh, so let's look at some of the different presidents and their approval ratings or their popularity ratings. As you can see, the approval ratings are volatile, and we've talked about this. We know this to be a fact. But just looking for some examples, on average, presidents will leave office with a lower approval rating than it is when they entered office. It was a, at a higher level. So what, what you'll see is during the last year, typically within the last year, presidents will start to promote and try to pass more and more legislation and do things like pardons or reprieves or that sort of thing because it's, now this is on the second term, okay? Because they know that they're on the way out, basically. So they don't care. They're not getting reelected. So the now um, you really see what I like to call the true colors of the president. So if you look at starting at Kennedy, he's a good example. Uh, of course, you know, his approval ratings had dropped just even before he was assassinated. Obviously, uh, there's nothing after that. Johnson, LBJ, uh, very high approval ratings and then lower toward the end. Nixon was really low, especially uh, after the facts of Watergate came to light. And then you have Ford, again, Carter, Reagan on, on both accounts generally. Well, he left similar to when he came in, but still, if you notice the trend, uh, what we like to call in the stock market, or any type of graph line, when you have ups and downs, it's it's a trend. It's a trend line. So the trend line is up and down, as with Bush number one and Clinton, and then Bush two was uh, one of the presidents that reached historic lows in popularity. But you'll notice, especially after uh, September the 11th, and we go back to the idea of emotional thinking or decision-making, his popularity was uh, historically high. And as you can see, again, President Obama as well, approval ratings were higher entering office and lower exiting the office. Jimmy Carter, uh, some of you mentioned him in the discussion also known as the peanut farmer, the peanut man, did not enjoy a very favorable presidency. Granted, Carter did, did have some excellent ideas 
and he was a very smart man. The economic conditions that surrounded his presidency um, ultimately handed him, uh, quite handedly, I should say, a defeat was given to him when he ran against Ronald Reagan. So unfortunately, uh, Jimmy Carter did not have history on his side, as I've said numerous times in the course and throughout this lecture. A lot of things, when it, especially certainly when it comes to favorability or any type of success in any executive office, depends on a lot of variables that are uncontrollable. And the economy is certainly one of those variables that is uncontrollable. So unfortunately, Jimmy Carter experienced that as well. Presidential powers. Um, so a little bit more about what is stated and what is not stated. Constitutional powers, statutory, expressed, and inherit constitutional powers are things that are explicitly said in the Constitution, such as uh, State of the Union. State of the Union is required annually except for the first year of the president. So uh, that's a good example. Statutory powers, things that are or have been developed in the law, expressly written powers, things that are in uh, such as executive orders, inherit powers, or sort of customary powers are things that the president has sort of inherited as the office has evolved over the last 200 and um, 50 uh, some odd years. Those executive orders we were talking about, the Federal Register actually publishes those executive orders. That is available for free to view for those of you who need entertainment online. Also, they're available uh, in paper, if you want to go to DC and check them out, executive memorandums, things that are tacked on to bills or executive orders. Uh, the book talks about Obama's orders on unauthorized immigrants. Um, that's a lot of the controversy we've seen here initially in the Trump presidency was the problems that were presented with unauthorized immigrants. And of course, each president and each party has a different way or a, di a different philosophical view of how to deal with issues. So that's one of the uh, reasons why you've seen such an upstir in the media or, you know, all this controversy in the media is because. So the next power. And the executive privilege was something that made Richard Nixon famous. And the reason he invoked the privilege was because there was an ongoing investigation with the Watergate issue. And if you didn't learn about Watergate in history class, I suggest you look into that because it had a very large impact on the executive privilege and even the executive office of the presidency afterwards. Uh, so uh, a lot of interesting history there. And again, Nixon ultimately resigned due to Watergate and the surrounding mysteries of what actually took place. You know, we'll honestly, we'll quite honestly never know because Nixon never went on record to say what actually happened uh, or even if anything did happen. We don't know that. So it's it's good not to assume that as well. Uh, just be familiar with the executive privilege there. Uh, signing statements, that's another one of the powers that the president has. Basically, what is is when a president signs a bill into law and he may write some things out that he finds is not necessary or he does not think is absolute he or she does not think is absolutely constitutional 
some examples of abuses of executive power and impeachment. Uh, Presidents Johnson and Nixon are examples of executive power and abuse of, and President Bill Clinton was ultimately impeached, and uh, we know the reasons surrounding that. I won't get into that, uh, but basically there was the whole affair with Monica Lewinsky and that type of thing. So remember, impeachment does not mean a president is actually kicked out of office. It means that he is under formal review and can ultimately be removed from office if he is found, the charges uh, are found to be ultimately true. And here's a picture of Bill Clinton campaigning in Cleveland, Ohio. And Ohio is another one of those important states that, you know, can swing the election. It's what we call a swing state. Ultimately, Clinton was not forced to leave office because of his impeachment. And the why, because of that, again, uh, ultimately, he was not found, it was not found that he had, he had to leave office. So, like it or not, that was the decision behind that. The cabinet, what I'm talking about earlier with the individuals in the cabinet, those people make up the advisory board for the president. So you have uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the uh, Economic Council, Foreign Policy Council, all those different types of things. So those members are called, uh, they make up what we know as the Kitchen Cabinet. So they are part of the organization of the presidency. So again, they are a very vital resource to the president and his day-to-day -day decision making when it comes to the availability of information. Remember that good leaders always look to what they have to make decisions. They look at the information, they look at the data, they look at what's available uh, to them. But unfortunately, even in a, something as large as an executive organization in the United States, there is often limited information um, that is available to make decisions. So the presidential use of cabinets is, is very important. And as we can see throughout history, there are presidents that decide to use cabinets more than others. and Ultimately, success rates do depend on the ability to rally a team around you and have them support you and know that they are with you in the decision making. So that's what makes a successful uh, organization. And you can see this is a famous picture right after uh, we received word that Osama bin Laden had been captured. Ultimately, um, he was killed. This is a picture of that in the Situation Room of the White House. You can see the president is surrounded by his staff there, um, including Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State then, and also Robert Gates, who was the Secretary of Defense. And there's also uh, Joe Biden as well there on the left. Uh, what we, he came to be known as uh, Uncle Joe, famously, after this was taken. Executive Office of the President, we'll talk about this a little bit, because we have already went through a, a lot of this stuff as well in our other discussions. The White House Office, Chief of Staff, I mentioned the Chief of Staff, White House Military Office, so that is all based with inside the White House. And again, I did discuss the idea of influence of the staff. Um, the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, controls uh, basically any type of budget that is put out there. They audit it and review it to ensure that it is correct and that it is being followed properly. National Security Council, again, 
another advisory board to the president, basically deals with foreign affairs, any types of military threats that may be, uh, you know, happening or potentially happening against the U.S. The vice president, we'll talk about the vice president very briefly because we're coming to a close here on this discussion. The president's right-hand man is the vice president. So he strengthens the ticket, what is known as strengthening the ticket, because typically what happens is you have a president uh, who has knowledge and subject matter expertise in one area, the vice president knows about other things. So typically, vice presidents know more about foreign policy than presidents do, on average. And then you bring these individuals together, you have a stronger ticket, uh, and the vice president supports the president. And in the event something happens to him or her, he or she succeeds the president. The current vice president is Mike Pence who was former governor of Indiana. So Mike Pence is now our current vice president and they have been in office, uh, the Trump administration has been in office for less than one year. So it's really hard to gauge um, anything that uh, has happened or sort of quantify that or give credit to whoever for things that have happened. So we'll see how that goes as time progresses. This is a very famous picture of Lyndon Baines Johnson that was taken right after JFK was assassinated and he was sworn in on Air Force One. Um, so that was actually where that picture was taken. I don't know why that uh, that's not included on there, but uh, that's where he was sworn in as by a federal judge at the time. So um, it was very sad that, that JFK had to uh, go through what he went through, but that is unfortunately one of the unforeseen duties that come with the office as well, because at the end of the day, we have enemies. The United States has enemies, and those some of those enemies have no problem uh, with being cowards and with targeting people that are vulnerable, such as JFK. And JFK wanted to see those people in Dallas, and he wanted them to see him and ultimately they advised him to put the top over the car or ride in a bulletproof car but he refused that because he was not a coward line of succession to the presidency of the United States um, I won't go over all of these but remember that basically there is a line that is followed in the event that um, a president is uh, assassinated or taken out and the vice president as well, you would then go to the Speaker of the House, representatives, and then so on and so forth. But don't worry, you won't be asked to memorize that. I hope that you all have enjoyed this discussion on the American presidency. Remember that you will probably more than likely see uh, a lot of these things again. You will see the information come up again. Uh, when you prepare and you're doing your readings and when you're doing your learning, just keep that in mind that I want you to know about the Congress. I want you to know about the presidency. I want you to know about the court system. Those are the main three things that I, I emphasize here in this course. Now, obviously there are a lot of other things, but those are the things that you learn and you pick up on 
uh, on your own. My goal is to deliver and drive home the main points of this course, and that is what I'm doing here by providing you all with the video lectures. And I certainly hope that you've enjoyed it. It is always a, a privilege, and quite frankly, it's an honor to be able to bring this to you. And hopefully, you all have taken something away from um, the video and even with your readings and the discussions in, in class. It's been very enjoyable to interact with you all and learn about who you are and to also read some of your, your comments and your discussions. They are very fascinating. So please keep up the good work and keep enjoying the learning process. And I hope that you all have a great week, and I'll see you soon.